Chapter 6 The youth awakened slowly. He came gradually back to a position from which he could regard himself. For moments he had been scrutinising his person in a dazed way, as if he had never before seen himself. Then he picked up his cap from the ground. He wriggled in his jacket to take a more comfortable fit, and kneeling, replaced his shoe. He thoughtfully mopped his reeking features. So it was all over at last. The supreme trial had been passed, the red formidable difficulties of war had been vanquished. He went into an ecstasy of self-satisfaction. He had the most delightful sensations of his life. Standing as if apart from himself, he viewed that last scene. He perceived that the man who had fought thus was magnificent. He felt that he was a fine fellow. He saw himself even with those ideals which he had considered as far beyond him. He smiled in deep gratification. Upon his fellows he beamed tenderness and goodwill. Gee, ain't it hot, eh? He said affably to a man who was polishing his streaming face with his coat sleeves. You bet, said the other, grinning sociably. I never seen such dumb hotness. He sprawled out luxuriously on the ground. Gee, yeah, and I hope we don't have no more fighting till a week from Monday. There were some handshakings and deep speeches with men whose features were familiar, but with whom the youth now felt bonds of tied hearts. He helped a cursing comrade to bind up a wound of the shin. But of a sudden, cries of amazement broke out along the ranks of the new regiment. Here they come again! Here they come again! The man who had sprawled upon the ground started up and said, Gosh! The youth turned quick eyes upon the field. He discerned forms beginning to swell in masses out of the distant wood. He again saw the tilted flag speeding forwards. The shells, which had ceased to trouble the regiment for a time, came swirling again, and exploded in the grass or among the leaves of the trees. They looked to be strange war flowers, bursting into fierce bloom. The men groaned. The lustre faded from their eyes. Their smudged countenances now expressed a profound dejection. They moved their stiffened bodies slowly, and watched in sullen mood the frantic approach of the enemy. The slaves, toiling in the temple of this god, began to feel rebellion at his harsh tasks. They fretted and complained to each to each. Oh, say this is too much of a good thing. Why can't somebody send us supports? We ain't never going to stand this second banging. I didn't come here to fight the whole damn rebel army. There was one who raised a doleful cry. I wish Bill Smithers had trod on my hand instead of treading on his. The sore joints of the regiment creaked as it painfully floundered into position to repulse. The youth stared. Surely he thought this impossible thing was not about to happen. He waited, as if he expected the enemy to suddenly stop, apologise and retire, bowing. It was all a mistake. But the firing began somewhere on the regimental line and ripped along in both directions. The level sheets of flame developed great clouds of smoke that tumbled and tossed in the mild wind near the ground for a moment and then rolled through the ranks as though through a gate. The clouds were tinged with an earth-like yellow in the sun rays and in the shadow was a sorry blue. The flag was sometimes eaten and lost in this mass of vapour, but more often it projected, sun-touched, resplendent. Into the youth's eyes there came a quick look that one can see in the orbs of a jaded horse. His neck was quivering with nervous weakness, and the muscles of his arms felt numb and bloodless. His hands, too, seemed large and awkward, as if he were wearing invisible mittens, and there was a great uncertainty about his knee joints. The words that comrades had uttered previous to the firing began to recur to him. Oh, say, this is too much of a good thing. What do they take us for? Why don't they send supports? I didn't come here to fight the whole damn rebel army. He began to exaggerate the endurance, the skill and the valour of those who were coming. Himself reeling from exhaustion, he was astonished beyond measure at such persistency. They must be machines of steel. It was very gloomy, struggling against such affairs, wound up perhaps to fight until sundown. He slowly lifted his rifle, and catching a glimpse of the thick spread field, he blazed at a cantering cluster. He stopped then, and began to peer as best as he could through the smoke. He caught changing views of the ground covered with men who were all running like pursued imps and yelling. To the youth, 
It was an onslaught of redoubtable dragons. He became like the man who lost his legs at the approach of the red and green monster. He waited in a sort of horrified, listening attitude. He seemed to shut his eyes and wait to be gobbled. A man near him, who up to this time had been working feverishly at his rifle, suddenly stopped and ran with howls. A lad whose face had borne an expression of exalted courage, the majesty of he who dares give his life, was at an instant smitten abject. He blanched like one who has come to the edge of a cliff at midnight and is suddenly made aware. There was a revelation. He too threw down his gun and fled. There was no shame in his face. He ran like a rabbit. Others began to scamper away through the smoke. The youth turned his head, shaken from his trance by this movement as if the regiment was leaving him behind. He saw the few fleeting forms. He yelled then with fright and swung about. For a moment in the great clamour he was like a proverbial chicken. He lost the direction of safety. Destruction threatened him from all points. Directly he began to speed towards the rear in great leaps. His rifle and cap were gone. His unbuttoned coat bulged in the wind. The flap of his cartridge box bobbed wildly and his canteen by its slender cord swung out behind. On his face was all the horror of those things which he imagined. The lieutenant sprang forward bawling. The youth saw his features wrathfully red and saw him make a dab with his sword. His one thought of the incident was that the lieutenant was a peculiar creature to feel interested in such matters upon this occasion. He ran like a blind man. Two or three times he fell down. Once he knocked his shoulder so heavily against a tree that he went headlong. Since he had turned his back upon the fight, his fears had been wondrously magnified. Death about to thrust him between the shoulder blades was far more dreadful than death about to smite him between the eyes. When he thought of it later, he conceived the impression that it is better to view the appalling than to be merely within hearing. The noises of the battle were like stones. He believed himself liable to be crushed. As he ran on, he mingled with others. He dimly saw men on his right and on his left, and he heard footsteps behind him. He thought that all the regiment was fleeing, pursued by those ominous crashes. In his flight, the sound of these following footsteps gave him one meagre relief. He felt vaguely that death must take first choice of the men who were nearest. The initial morsels for the dragons would be those who were still following him. So he displayed the zeal of an insane sprinter in his purpose to keep them in his rear. There was a race. As he, leading, went across a little field, he found himself in a region of shells. They hurtled over his head with long, wild screams. As he listened, he imagined them to have rows of cruel teeth that grinned at him. Once one lit before him and the livid lightning of the explosion effectually barred the way in his chosen direction. He grovelled on the ground and then, springing up, went careering off through some bushes. He experienced a thrill of amazement when he came within view of a battery in action. The men there seemed to be in conventional moods, altogether unaware of the impending annihilation. The battery was disputing with a distant antagonist, and the gunners were wrapped in admiration of their shooting. They were continually bending in coaxing postures over the guns. They seemed to be patting them on the back and encouraging them with words. The guns, stolid and undaunted, spoke with dogged valour. The precise gunners were coolly enthusiastic. They lifted their eyes every chance to the smoke-wreathed hillock from whence the hostile battery addressed them. The youth pitied them as he ran. Methodical idiots. Machine-like fools. The refined joy of planting shells in the midst of another battery's formation would appear a little thing when the infantry came swooping out of the woods. The face of a youthful rider, who was jerking his frantic horse with an abandon of temper he might display in a placid barnyard, was impressed deeply upon his mind. He knew that he looked upon a man who would presently be dead. Too, he felt a pity for the guns, standing six good comrades in a bold row. He saw a brigade going to the relief of its pestered fellows. He scrambled upon a wee hill and watched it sweeping finely, keeping formation in difficult places. The blue of the line was crusted with steel colour, and the brilliant flags projected. Officers were shouting. This sight also filled him with wonder. The brigade was hurrying briskly to be gulped into the infernal mouths of the war god. 
What manner of men were they, anyhow? Ah, it was some wondrous breed, or else they didn't comprehend. The fools. A furious order caused a commotion in the artillery. An officer on a bounding horse made a maniacal motion with his arms. The teams went swinging up from the rear. The guns were whirled about and the battery scampered away. The cannon, with their noses poked slantingly at the ground, grunted and grumbled like stout men, brave but with objections to hurry. The youth went on, moderating his pace since he had left the place of noises. Later he came upon a general of division, seated upon a horse that pricked his ears in an interested way at the battle. There was a great gleaming of yellow and patent leather about the saddle and bridle. The quiet man astride looked mouse-coloured upon such a splendid charger. A jingling staff was galloping hither and thither. Sometimes the general was surrounded by horsemen, and at other times he was quite alone. He looked to be much harassed. He had the appearance of a businessman, whose market is swinging up and down. The youth went slinking around this spot. He went as near as he dared, trying to overhear words. Perhaps the general, unable to comprehend chaos, might call upon him for information. And he could tell him. He knew all concerning it. Of a surety the force was in effects, and any fool could see that if they did not retreat while they had the opportunity, what— He felt that he'd like to thrash that general— or at least approach him and tell him in plain words exactly what he thought him to be. It was criminal to stay calmly in one spot, and make no effort to stay destruction. He loitered, in a fever of eagerness for the division commander to apply to him. As he warily moved about, he heard the general call out irritably, "'Tompkins, go over and see Taylor, and tell him not to be in such an all-fired hurry. Tell him to halt his brigade in the edge of the woods. Tell him to detach a regiment, say, and—' I think the centre. It'll break if we don't help it out some. And tell him to hurry up. A slim youth on a fine chestnut horse caught these swift words from the mouth of his superior. He made his horse bound into a gallop almost from a walk in his haste to go upon his mission. There was a cloud of dust. A moment later the youth saw the general bounce excitedly in his saddle. Yes, by heavens, they have! The officer leaned forward. His face was aflame with excitement. Yes, by heavens, they've held them, they've held them. He began to blithely roar at his staff. We'll wallop them now, we'll wallop them now, we've got them for sure. He turned suddenly upon an aide. Here, you, Jones, ride quick after Tompkins. See, Taylor, tell him to go in everlastingly like blazes, anything. As another officer sped his horse after the first messenger, the general beamed upon the earth like a sun. In his eyes was a desire to chant a pian. He kept repeating, They've held them by heavens. His excitement made his horse plunge, and he merrily kicked and swore at it. He held a little carnival of joy on horseback. <laughs>